Okay, let me read chapter 3 and then we'll get into our, our kind of breakdown of the chapter. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps and the prefects and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, Trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore at that time when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready at that moment, you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipes, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning or the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes, and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He said to his officials, or his high officials, Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
Come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own, uh, their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their house is reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no other god who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. So as we come back here, it's a, a very popular story in Scripture. In fact, it's probably in the, I would say, top five. If you were to ask people about famous stories in Scripture or what they remember from their time in, in Sunday school or in, in uh, like a children's ministry, of course you have the fiery furnace, the lion's den, you probably have Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the great fish. You know, those would certainly be up there. And so this is a very well-known story. Uh, some people see it as a, a fictional story, maybe teaching some kind of a greater spiritual meaning. Uh, we understand that because the Word of God uh, is inspired, that all Scripture is inspired, all Scripture is God-breathed, uh, and this is narrative, there's no reason for us to believe that this did not happen exactly as we have read it this morning. Mm -hmm. This is an actual event that took place and we have the facts before us. Uh, so when we look at this, many times you have uh, it taught that uh, what we really see here is, is to be courageous like these men. And that certainly is something we have to look at. They demonstrated courage, they demonstrated great faith and resolve and a spirit of no compromise uh, in the face of, of certain persecution and ultimately death. Uh, but really the, the main point here as we look at this, it always has to come back to something that, that glorifies God, that demonstrates who God is. And in this chapter, it clearly shows us that, that God is the one true God. Nebuchadnezzar once again is given evidence, he's given proof that the God that these men serve, uh, it, at least in his mind at this point, he is superior to all the other gods. Uh, but the reality is, is he is the only God, the only true God. The gods that Nebuchadnezzar serve, the false gods, uh, have no power to demonstrate because they don't exist. And so as we look at this, uh, yes, there is a, a call to idolatry involved, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, there is clearly um, a, a, uh, an attitude of courage and confidence and faith that is resolved to, to go to uh, any uh, extreme necessary, even death. And so we'll see that. But in the end, it is God who demonstrates his delivering power. And it is God who is praised by this pagan king once again. And so the main character of this event is God himself. Uh, so last week as we looked at, at chapter 2 and then we began to kind of introduce chapter 3, uh, a question was how much time has lapsed between chapter 2 verse 49 and chapter 3 verse 1? And, and the, the, the answer is we really don't know. Okay? There is no conclusive evidence given for any date other than we know for sure it took place after chapter 2 and before the events of chapter 4. Um, but we don't know the exact time. Now there are uh, differing views. Uh, if you were to take a look at the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, there is an addition in this text that states that these events took place in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, uh, which was one year before the fall of Jerusalem. Jerusalem fell in 586, so that would have put this event at 587 BC. That's assuming that the translators of the Septuagint knew something that we don't see here, and they were given that you know, divine message that these things took place in 587. Um, and so that's one idea, is that it happened much later, after the events of chapter 2. Other commentators say that you know, this actually took place a little closer than that, but the years are not given because nobody really knows. 
So we just don't know how long there was in between the, the last verse of chapter 2 and the first verse of chapter 3. We're not given that information. Um, and, and so it, it would be kind of fruitless to speculate and, or, or even come to a, I guess we could speculate, but we don't want to come to a dogmatic position and say it absolutely happened at this time. We're just not told that information. So the fact there was an 18 year there can the dream, um, that gives us some kind of a clue, and you get kind of a little clue. Although nobody knows exactly what it was, but, but does that give us some kind of clue, and some kind of hint? Well, that, that's coming from a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And so that is not, I would say that that Septuagint, that is not inspired the way the original Hebrew text was. And we don't know, you know, that that is accurate, but that is added in that translation. And so that's just something that's out there as far as an opinion is concerned. Now, I mean, I, I don't know how long it would take them to build an image that is 90 feet tall. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting if you look at our construction today, and that's with heavy machinery and computers and all the technology we have. Some things go up very quickly and other projects take forever. And you don't know whether or not they're just dragging their feet and it's really that difficult to build. Without having what we have, uh, as far as technology goes, I don't know how long it would have taken. I mean, even to try to speculate, well, if it's this tall and this wide, and, and you know, if they started immediately after the events of chapter two, then it could have been about this many years. Uh, we just don't know for sure. But some time has elapsed where there was enough time to plan, to develop, to build, to construct this, this big image. And uh, we'll talk about that image a little bit later, but just, uh, so you get kind of a picture in your mind, that image was just a little bit smaller than the Statue of Liberty itself. Not the base, but the statue itself. That it was a pretty good image, a pretty good size image. Well, you know, you know, Pastor, so. um, that's really interesting because I was watching something about uh, the pyramids and the way they build these three pyramids. And it's amazing, all those bricks that were really heavy, how they moved them with no machinery. Mm -hmm. So yep. they built a yeah. statue, it should be a drop in the bucket. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's like, man. It's certainly something I could not construct, so my bucket would be empty. But uh, I don't know how long well, it would have taken to do that. Well, because how they built the pyramids, and there were three pyramids they built at the same time. And it took them, it took them like years to do it. Yeah, and that's why when you see things like these that are similar to, to constructions like this, that's why you see uh, the, the seven wonders of the world and these things. Like, well, how did they build these things in ancient times? But yeah. coming back to this, we know that this was something that they built. Uh, we don't know exactly when it was built and when this dedication uh, was called for. Uh, we really don't have the exact date. We just know that it's after the events of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2. Um, so, so that's what we see here. This is what was taking place after the events of chapter 2, but we don't know exactly when. What was taking place was the dedication of an image, the dedication, what we would call it an altar. It was an image, a statue, uh, or it was uh, an idol, um, not an altar, an idol. Uh, and so we see that here, that's going to be described in this. We also see a plot to kill Daniel's companions. Uh, there is opportunity here. There were those people within the nation of Babylon, uh, those Babylonians, those Chaldeans, who do not like the fact one bit that these Jewish captives are, are taking positions of authority that are being given honor by the king. They're very jealous about that. And so they use this opportunity to plot against them. We'll see that. Uh, so what is the significance of all of this? Well, there's definitely a demonstration of faith and obedience. We see that with these three men. Uh, there is a demonstration of the power of God as he saves them from the furnace of fire. And then in the end, we see a declaration concerning the superiority of God. Once again, a pagan king uh, a pagan sovereign is going to give praise and glory and, and honor and recognition to the ultimate sovereign. And so we see that in the last few verses of chapter 3. So if you were to look at an outline and kind of break this chapter down, you can see three main sections. One is the dedication of the king's image in verses 1 through 7. And then the disregard for the king's command, that's verses 8 through 12. And then the deliverance from the king's wrath in verses 13 through 30. So, Let's take a look at this first one, which is the dedication of the king's image, and we'll talk a little more about the image and uh, the meaning of it. And so, as I mentioned, this image of gold, as we see here, we're told that it was 60 cubits in its width and 6 cubits. I'm sorry, the height was 60 cubits and the width was 6 cubits. 
Uh, a cubit was 18 inches. And so when you're looking at this in feet, it was 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And so it was a, a very tall, kind of thin statue. Right? And uh, there has been a lot of uh, discussion within commentaries and archaeology whether or not this was an image of a man or because it wouldn't really be proportionate if it was 90 feet high and then it was only um, 9 feet wide. But uh, there were, in, in many uh, archaeological finds, you have a base that the image would stand upon. And so if the base took up a portion of that height and then you have the rest of that for the height of the image and the, the width of it, it could very well be proportionate to the image of Nebuchadnezzar himself. That's one of the ideas here, is that it could be an image of him, that it could be an image of another god in the, uh, the Babylonian uh, um, arena of worship there. We're just not told what it is. We are told it was an image that he made and he set up. Okay, he made an image of gold in verse 1. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And so, again, just like with the timing of it, we don't know exactly when this took place. And we don't know exactly what this image represented. Uh, but I think it's pretty safe to say it either represented Nebuchadnezzar or it represented one of the Babylonian gods. Those are two safe choices. And wherever you fall on that, that um, uh, debate there, I think you are well within safety uh, to say it was either a god or it was Nebuchadnezzar. Or perhaps it was Nebuchadnezzar who saw himself as a god. You know, that's also a very a good possibility. Uh, these were very common statues. If you do any kind of research, any reading about some of the archaeological finds in the ancient Near East, you will find uh, many statues that would resemble something like this, where you have a base and then the image itself and then carvings and some kind of animal or deity, something on the top of that. And so this was not anything uncommon. It was very common to see in this period of time in this part of the world. And uh, the, the gold aspect, we don't know if it was solid gold, or if it was something that was made of wood or some other metal and then plated with gold. Right? But uh, the outside material was gold. Whether it was solid or whether it was plated, it was a brilliant gold statue. And uh, that is what is being uh, um, constructed and displayed here on the plain of Dura. Now when we look at the plain of Dura, we don't know where that is. There's a lot of question marks here. Just because there are question marks, let me go back and, and make this clear again. Just because there are some questions that are not answered doesn't mean that these things didn't take place. Just because we're not given the specific date or we're given the specific um, identity of the image or the specific location of the plain of Dura, it does not mean that it didn't take place. Um, but what we do know here, it's interesting, the Akkadian word Duru means a walled place. And uh, archaeologists have found things like this in doing their research in and around the regions of what we'd call the ancient Near East and in Babylon. Um, archaeologists, archaeologists have uncovered, uh, I was reading, a large square made of brick six miles southeast of Babylon. And this large square that was brick, it could have been a, a pedestal, kind of a platform for an image that once stood there. Now, again, that's not um, um, conclusive. But it, it does kind of match the area where that could have been. Uh, many commentators believe that this plain of Dura might have been just outside the city walls and out in that area where you could see it uh, from miles around. And you certainly be able to see it from within the city uh, if you were on a higher position. And then coming into it, one of the first things you would see is this massive statue as you're going in uh, towards that part of the town. And, and so its location, being out there in a, uh, the, the plain of Dura, and the height of that image would make it very noticeable, very impressive. You know, that's kind of the idea. I mentioned the Statue of Liberty. Uh, if you've ever been out to New York and you've been out to uh, Liberty Island or you go to, you know, you're on the ferry out there and you kind of loop around, they come in and you see the statue there. Or just even pictures when you're going in from the ocean, the water. And, and what do you see when you're coming in? This massive statue. It's impressive to see Lady Liberty standing there as you're coming into New York City. And uh, that's kind of the idea that what we see here, if you can kind of imagine, take yourself back there, you're out there wandering, and as you're kind of getting closer to Babylon, and you start to see in the distance, one of the first things you see, if not the first thing that's, that's maybe made by human hands, is this massive image. And then you go into the, the uh, city of Babylon. And so uh, it was meant to be seen, it was meant to be uh, impressive, and that's certainly what happened here. Nebuchadnezzar is gathering all of these people together. When you look at verses 2 through 4, 
He's gathering all the officials. And uh, we have a list of all of these officials. And it really does give us an indication that this was a kingdom-wide proclamation. They were all required to come. Not the entire kingdom, but representatives of the kingdom. People who represented, it, the, who represented the entire kingdom of Babylon. You have the governors who were civil administrators, the counselors uh, who were advisors to those in governmental authority. You have treasurers who administered the funds of the kingdom. You have judges who were the administrators of the law, the magistrates who passed judgment in keeping with the law. And then kind of this umbrella term, the, all the rulers of the provinces. So they were perhaps authorities that worked under the satraps. And so what is pretty clear here is that you have representatives of the entire kingdom. All the peoples that are under the authority of Babylon, they are represented here by these groups of leaders, or this group of leaders. And, and they're called together. They're called together to pay public homage to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, to this image, to pay their allegiance, to, to kind of reaffirm that. And, and so this was um, you know, something that Nebuchadnezzar was doing to maybe um, strengthen the unity of the kingdom. Uh, some commentators have suggested that maybe he had a problem um, with his own security and he needed to be reaffirmed, you know, to have that, okay, we worship you, we, we affirm who you are. And, and then coming off of the, the image in Daniel 2, that vision of Nebuchadnezzar being the head of gold, uh, kind of running with that, where, hey, this is who I am, I'm about to construct an image that represents me, let's get everyone here to recognize that, that what I saw, this represents what I saw, this is me. I'm the head of the statue, so here's an entire statue that represents how glorious I am. So I certainly would say that's not uh, beyond um, reason then. Is it a part of the brainwashing, like in chapter one? The same type of like, um, brainwashing the captives? I think that that could have been part of it. This was not just the captives who were called. This is everyone. These right. are the Chaldeans. These are people who would represent the entire nation. So, um, but certainly those who are serving him would be called to do the same thing, as we see with the three friends. Uh, this is another uh, exercise for them to demonstrate their loyalty to their new king. At least that would be in, in the mind of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, you're here. I gave you this position of authority. You need to bow down. You need to worship. You need to show publicly that you have sworn allegiance to me, you know. And, and by doing this in a public arena, it's going to be for everyone to see. Mm -hmm. so, so that's that's what we see happening here in verses um, uh, 1 through 7. Now look at verse 8 and following. You see the disregard for the king's command. You know, and as I read this, every time I come through and read this chapter, I, I am more and more convinced that even though Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, did not bow, I don't think, just from reading this, that there was any kind of um, intent to, to dishonor the king. I, it seemed that they were very honorable men, that they served him well. And um, it, it's just that their loyalty to the one true God uh, is greater than their loyalty to any human king, whether it's a Jewish king or a Babylonian king. And you know, it is, it is, it, it is very, um, well, let me try to figure out my words here. We, we as followers of God can stand in complete opposition to different people in this world and their worldviews, but still be respectful and still be kind, still be considerate. And, and, and I think that these men probably demonstrated that. They were not here trying to insult the king, but they had their convictions and they weren't going to change that. And these Chaldeans knew that. These men who bring charges knew that. Just like when you have Daniel, uh, when he's found praying in his upper room facing Baharaj in Jerusalem, they knew what he was going to do. They knew his character. They knew the pattern of his life, and they used that against him. You see that here. This is a, a perfect opportunity to, to catch these men uh, and to trap them in a way where they can't escape because the king makes this... this kingdom-wide proclamation, and he has to follow through, as we'll see in just a bit. Although Nebuchadnezzar thought, might have thought that it was a when they said that they would not bow, Nebuchadnezzar might have thought that they were dishonoring him. Well, he certainly did take that in that way. What I'm saying is, is I don't necessarily think that they were standing there with an attitude of disrespect. You can stand there with a lot of respect and composure and say, I won't do that, but you're not being abrasive, you're not being caustic, you're not being insulting. And I think that's, that's what I'm saying with these men. 
because I don't think that they were there trying to protest and you know rally against the king and call him out as a heretic and a false a false god. I, I think that what you see there is they are standing against this proclamation, but they're doing it in a respectful way. Yeah. You know? um, so as you look at this, there is a dilemma for these Jewish officials, for these men. Uh, and I think the Chaldeans were aware of that. I mean, they, they captured these Jewish people. They were retraining them. They were somewhat familiar with what their views were. And uh, they would see that they can't do this. It's against their religion. It's against their faith. For them, they would be committing idolatry. You look at Exodus 20, 23, you shall not make other gods besides me, gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. Deuteronomy 4, 16, so that you do not act corruptly and make a graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female. And Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. These men understood, and I would say they understood from birth, you know, as early as they can, can hear and comprehend from a young age, they were taught, certainly, the law. They were taught the commandments. Right? You're not going to worship other gods. You're not going to bow down to other gods. And so for them to bow down to this image, um, whatever or whoever it represented, that is idolatry. And they knew that they could not um, do that. And, and so these Chaldeans, they saw this dedication ceremony as an opportunity to attack, an opportunity to eliminate the foreigners uh, that they saw every day as an insult to their, their existence as Babylonians. To say that they're going to come in here and take our jobs, they're going to come in here and take the, the honor that is rightfully ours and the glory that is ours, they're just Jewish captives, they're Jewish slaves. They don't deserve to be here. So, so you can imagine how upset they were and uh, would use any opportunity to get rid of them. And so that's what happens here. Uh, they, they want to make sure that they use this to take these men out. So they plot against them. And then they come to the king. If you look at verse um, 9, they come and say, Oh, king, live forever. They approach him properly. They give him reverence and respect. And then they come in and they remind him. As if the king didn't know, they remind him, You know, you made a decree. Remember this king? You made a decree uh, kingdom-wide that uh, people have to bow down when they hear the music, that these officials that you've called together, they are called to fall and worship. And those who don't, O king, remember, they're to be thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. And, and by the way, these officials who didn't bow are Jews that you appointed. Right? I mean, that really is laying all the responsibility, in a sense, on Nebuchadnezzar. Look, everyone else bowed, but these guys didn't. And you appointed these Jews in these high places in our kingdom. So they're not telling him what to do, but they are telling him what to do. Well, they're kind of making him the bad guy when, you know... Yeah, well, what, what they're really doing is they're, they're, they're saying this. They're like, look, you, you made this proclamation. There's a problem because of these men you appointed. And, and because you have made this proclamation, you have to follow through. You don't have another choice. And they said, they said, they are disregarding you. And it's a very strong term that they are using here uh, to disregard. I mean, it really is implying that they are doing this with intent to humiliate him, to embarrass him, to insult him uh, in a public way. And so it's almost like saying they're, they're mocking you. That they're really just, they're humiliating you in front of your kingdom. And when they say that they're disregarding you, it's not just a simple disregard. It's, it's these guys are, are making fun of you. Yeah, they're just defying you and, and doing it to make you look like a fool. And, and, and remember, King, you're the one who put them here. These are the men that you put here, these Jews. And, and so Nebuchadnezzar has to act. Uh, he, he has to go ahead and make sure that what his... Uh, the consequence that he said was going to happen, he had to make sure that that was going to take yeah, place. Yeah. And I don't think here that there was much hesitation as we look at this. Uh, he was enraged. Uh, he was probably embarrassed. He was angry. He was insulted. And so he acted on that. And, and uh, he calls the men, as we'll see in the next section, and he gives them one last chance to make things right. Okay? Um, uh, so let's, let's take a look at, at that. Well, before we do, let me just... Um, make one reference here to Daniel's absence, looking at uh, the top of page four. Daniel is not mentioned in this chapter. 
And there, there has been, and I'm sure there will be speculation as to where Daniel was, why he wasn't here. Uh, some have said that, and, and I don't, it's a minority from what I've read, that, that maybe Daniel did bow to me. I don't buy that one bit. Uh, I, I think a better explanation is that because of Daniel's greater position, uh, he might not have been in the region at the time. He might have been attending to other business and uh, you know, working as a, a personal representative of the king. He just he wasn't there at the time. Uh, we don't know for sure, but we do know that he's not mentioned in this, and so he's not part of this account. But I certainly don't think there's any evidence at all to say that Daniel compromised and that he bowed the knee to this image. Uh, it makes more sense that, that because of his position, he might have been away in a different region, a different area, handling business, and wasn't called to come back. Um, and, and so we, we know that that happens if you just look within our own government. There are times when representatives don't come to certain meetings or certain uh, gatherings because they're on official business. And so that could be the situation with Daniel. So we don't want to speculate too much, but he wasn't there. And I don't think there's any evidence to say that Daniel was a compromiser in any way at all. So if you look at uh, verses 13 through 30 now, we're going to look at this deliverance from the king's wrath. And there's um, more verses to cover here, but uh, I think we can finish it today. When you look here, he, he first begins, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, to confront these dissenters, these men who are standing against him and in Nebuchadnezzar's mind because of what he's been told and, and his mind's kind of running with it. Uh, these men are just standing against him. They're humiliating him. They're disrespecting him. And uh, certainly as being men who are captives, who have been given great responsibility, great honor, uh, great positions of authority, they should have great respect and gratitude for Nebuchadnezzar. And in his mind, I'm sure he's thinking, they should do whatever I ask, because look at what I've given them, look at how I've blessed them. And so he calls them in, and in verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these men were brought before the king. And so he says, all right, go get them. Go get these men, bring them back, we're gonna settle this right now, and that's what happens. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar responds and he questions them. Is it true? Is it, did this really happen? Did you really not bow the knee? What's the reason for this? You know, right now you have the opportunity to set things straight. Either they're misrepresenting you or you didn't and you have the chance right now to bow and everything's good. You're okay if you, if you take this opportunity. And so he questions them in verse 14. He says, did this really happen? Did you refuse? And if you did, if you're ready, verse 15, when you hear the music, fall down and worship. And if you do, very well. We're okay. Everything's good. You know, it's kind of like no harm, no foul, okay? We can go back to our business. But, um, but if you don't, if you don't, you're going to go immediately into the furnace of blazing fire. Okay? That's part of the proclamation that he gave before, but now he adds something on top of it. Knowing that these men are not true Babylonians, they're not true Chaldeans, they've been trained in those ways, but that's not who they are. And they still have loyalty to their God. And so Nebuchadnezzar then, he ups the ante. And he, and he says, look, you're going to be thrown into the furnace of fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hand? And so you really start to see the king's pride. You start to see his arrogance. You start to see maybe even his God, you know, his delusion that maybe he is somehow God-like. No, no God can save you from what I'm about to do. You know, and so he really is taking the position there of God. That I have power over your life. I can spare it or I can take it. That sounds a lot like Pontius Pilate. Remember when Jesus is standing before him? And he's not answering the questions that Pilate is asking. He says, why are you silent? Why don't you say anything? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you or to condemn you? And Jesus tells him what? You would have no authority over unless it was given to you from above. Like, yes, you have human authority, but in, but in the end, you don't have any authority. And, and Pilate needed to be reminded of that. Nebuchadnezzar is, is deluded here to think that he has more authority than God. Now, in his mind, it's the gods. But, but even then, you know, he, he, let's just say he was correct and pantheism is true, which we know it's not. That is an arrogant statement to say that the, none of these gods... I'm a mere mortal, but none of these gods can deliver you from my hand. I mean, that is just an arrogant statement. 
And uh, that's exactly what he's saying. So he's telling them, look, you're doomed. There's no hope for you. You can pray. You can call upon your God, but he's not going to respond. He's not going to save you because no God can deliver you from what I'm about to do. And so you see these men here. You know, he's, he's giving them that, that opportunity with this, this personal gathering. Hey, bring them over. Let's do this right now. And uh, he gives them this threat. You're going to be killed and no one can save you, not even your God. And then these men, once again, respectfully reject him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. Okay? They address him as king. O Nebuchadnezzar. They respect him in his human sovereignty. But they say, what they're saying is, our minds are set. Our decision is made. You know the answer. The answer hasn't changed. We're not going to bow. And then you look here at their resolve, their their. their confidence in God, their conviction to the God who created them. Verse 17 says, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And so they say, look, we have full confidence that our God will deliver us. But if he does not, we're still not going to bow. And we're willing to accept his will in this situation. That's really what they're saying. That if it's God's will to save us, he will save us from you. But if he chooses not to, we're okay with that. And I think I, I, think I could say for myself, I'm, I, I'm, I would rather not die in this manner <laughs> but I'm okay with the concept of death in serving Christ yeah. because I know where I'm going You're right. Right? I mean if you were to ask me would you rather die a martyr or die a, of an old age and raise your family and grandkids and great grandkids and enjoy a nice full life well yeah that sounds better mm -hmm. but whatever God has in store for my life we understand with God being the all knowing God who is good, just, merciful gracious never makes mistakes, always righteous, just, true. Any decision he makes, anything he allows, ultimately is for the good of his people and the glory of his name. And so if God chose to let these men die in this furnace of fire, it would have been the right choice. Even though from our human perspective, we look at that and say, well, isn't there an option B? Well, there's no option right? B. In, in this situation, we know it was the option A. It was to save them. But they were ready to accept in their minds what would have been option B. If God doesn't want to save us, we're okay with that. I don't know how many Christians today could say that. But these men had that resolve. And they said, whatever happens, we're ready to accept. And so, you know, the acceptance that God might not deliver these men is a testimony to their understanding about God and His will and His sovereignty and providence and all these these truths that we know about God. And, and when you look at Nebuchadnezzar now, he that, that just put him over the top. He was already filled with rage and anger. We saw that in verse 13. Now in verse 19, he was filled with wrath and his facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Whatever, whatever rage was building up in him was now clearly visible on his face. I don't know if you've ever stood before someone who is so angry or, or you might say crazy, I don't know, but where you see their face just change, the countenance changes, and it's almost scary. You're like, wow, <laughs> something's going on inside that person, and, and I can tell because of the look on their face, right? I, I, I remember seeing that, um, <laughs> kind of a funny thing, but I think of this when I, whenever I think of the countenance changing, I think of my little sister when she was, I don't know, maybe eight years old or seven years old. We, we shared a room together at that time and she had this, we had these hamsters, pets, and uh, she was touching one, she was, you know, trying to hold it and play with it, and she was looking real happy. And, and then, I didn't know it at the time, but it bit her on, on her thumb. And she went from, you know, happy and smiley to, and I saw her face change, and then it was this. And then she goes, she crushed it. Now, she's told that story as well, so I'm not telling anything that the family hasn't already 
to share. But I remember watching her face and it just changed like that. It went from happiness and joy to those warm fuzzies to your days are numbered and it's gonna happen right now. And she just did that, put him back in the cage and walked away and I was like, oh my gosh, what is my little sister capable of? I'm not gonna cross her again. She's gonna come over at night and take care of me. And I saw the countenance change. But you know, that's funny, but you look at this, Nebuchadnezzar's face changed. I mean, his rage was now worn on the outside. They could see that. There's no doubt. Anyone that was there knew Nebuchadnezzar was furious. So he gives commands to, to heat the furnace seven times hotter. Now we know that's hyperbole. They can't go seven times hotter. If you look at, at uh, studies of what the kilns would have been around that time, they operated at about 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Seven wow. times hotter would have been impossible for their technology. But you're looking at this, even if they added more wood and more fuel, maybe 2000 degrees. I mean, that was 1600 degrees is hot. He's making it hotter, and this really demonstrates how angry he is. Never yeah, just put him in there, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. This is hot, but we're really going to make it hot for these guys, wow. right? You, you hear people thinking, well, there's a special hotter pit in hell for that person. Nebuchadnezzar's like, these people, they were going to burn, but now they're really going to burn. Heat this thing up, crank it up, put in as much fuel as you can, and they're going in. And so they are bound up. Uh, we see that in verse 21. Uh, they're bound uh, with their trousers, their coats, their caps, and other clothes. And uh, the king's command was urgent, verse 22. And so the fire was extremely hot, and these valiant soldiers, these valiant warriors, who were to lead the men up to this, this um, furnace, which probably had an opening on the top, and Nebuchadnezzar could look in, they would drop them in there. Those men were consumed by the heat that was outside of the furnace. They were killed because of that. It was so hot. Wow. And uh, these three men fall into the furnace, and they're still tied up. Now, it's interesting. They're still tied up, which means the ropes are still intact. But the heat was enough to kill these valiant warriors before they even went inside the furnace. So right away, Nebuchadnezzar started to see that something's not right. Something weird is going on here. And, and so, as we look at this, uh, yeah, in that last section here, Nebuchadnezzar's plan was overpowered by God. You know, um, Rather than seeing these men reduced to ashes, uh, he saw them walking around safely. Wow. And not just three men, but four men. And Nebuchadnezzar's response in verse 25 is, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now, there is, again, discussion uh, about the identity of this fourth individual. Uh, some believe that it was an angel. Others believe that it was a Christophany, a pre-incarnate um, appearance of Jesus, the Christ. Oh, wow. and, and both happened in the Old Testament. There were times when God sent angels to deliver messages. There were times when the angel of the Lord came and delivered a message, and that was a Christophany, uh, the pre-incarnate Christ. We're not told here the identity of this fourth person. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, remember, Nebuchadnezzar is polytheistic, and uh, he's just saying, what I think what he's saying, we take at face value, he looks godlike. I don't think Nebuchadnezzar is saying this is a Christophany. I don't think Nebuchadnezzar is saying this is the Son of God, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. I don't think that's what Nebuchadnezzar is saying at all. What he's saying is, is that's no mere man in there with them. He's godlike. This is, this is a... a a divine, supernatural occurrence that's happening right now. So I don't think we want to run too far with what Nebuchadnezzar says, but we can say this, that, that regardless of the identity of the fourth person, that person was sent from heaven to protect these men, whether it was an angel or whether it was the pre-incarnate Christ. And I don't think whichever, again, whichever position you take, I don't think either one's a bad choice because there, there is that, that um, precedence in the Old Testament for both. Angels have appeared, and the pre-incarnate Christ has appeared before in the Old Testament. And, and so this was definitely a divine messenger, a divine deliverer to save these men. And recognizing this, Nebuchadnezzar says, bring them out. You, you men, you be three men, come out. You're the servants of the Most High God. Come out of the furnace right now. Wow. Clearly they're not harmed, and they're not going to be harmed. Nebuchadnezzar says, bring them out. And these men come out, you look at verse 27, and all the people who are gathered... Uh, it's not just Nebuchadnezzar, but he called the other officials there. And as they examined these men, okay, well, there's all kinds of witnesses. They've examined these men, 
And it says, They gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of the, of the men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. They didn't even smell like smoke. I mean, they were completely protected by God. We could maybe say like some kind of divine force field. I mean, whatever it was, not even the smoke was able to penetrate God's, you know, his, his protection of these men. But it emphasizes that they were thrown to the flames, still tied up. Mm -hmm. but they walked around in the flames, so somehow it was enough to remove the, the ropes, the, ropes the bonds, and yes. Their clothes. Right. That's yeah. Pretty impressive. It that is. Perfect in what you just told. Yeah, absolutely. And so when we look at that, like, wow, I mean, and if you've ever been around any kind of fire, you know the smoke. You, you can't come out of a fire, a nice campfire, you come back reeking of smoke. <laughs> you know, we love camping, we love going to the beach and having a, a bonfire there. When we come home, the clothes smell like smoke, the hair smells like smoke, the car smells like smoke. You smell it for days. These men were in the middle of the fire and you couldn't even tell that they had been in the fire. I mean, it's just an amazing, miraculous, divine protection and deliverance. How, how deep do you suppose some kind of brain, like a human would have been very, very large? Um, we don't know exactly how large it was, but just um, some of the, if you look at some of the uh, carvings of what has been found from um, the time period of so this, uh, they, rep they, they, they usually depict some kind of large, um, long kiln or furnace, and, and uh, sometimes there's an opening on the side to put fuel in, and like a, almost like a, a, a hole on top to look in, but it doesn't really give us the dimensions of that. But, um, you know, it probably would have been used to, to melt the metals and do a lot of that, that uh, metal work there. So um, I'm not quite sure how, how tall it was. But Nebuchadnezzar, from his higher perch where he was, he was able to look in and see them walking around. So I would say, I mean, just guessing. I mean, if, let's just say it was this big as this room, which I don't know. But if you were standing at the top, you could certainly see in. Um, it could have been quite large. Or it could have been something smaller, but it would have been certainly enough for four men to walk around, four grown men oh, yeah. to walk around in there. That was a pretty big furnace. <laughs> they didn't get hurt from being thrown in either. No, they didn't. Uh, completely not protected. Not yeah, the flames <laughs> didn't hurt them and the fall didn't damage them either. Yeah. So it's uh, so the pit was like so big and so so large. How could then have to see it? Well, that's why I said if you look at what some of the um, the uh, engravings and, and writings of the time back then, they've described these kilns with having openings on top where you could see into it. That's most likely where Nebuchadnezzar was looking from the top inside of it and having like, a clear window into what is there. So, yeah. I'm saying it was a large room it's because if they're throwing people in there. <laughs> It, it had to be big enough to fit you and me and JB and Steve. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh yeah. No, I don't know which of us. Is a, I don't know which of us is the son of the gods, but <laughs> but we all survived, right? Yeah. We all survived. <laughs> so when you look at this, let's move on so we can finish up in the next couple of minutes. Uh, you look at his praise for the Most High God, verse 26 and following. He just gives praise once again. He says, you know, you men, you you. You violated my command, verse 28. You yielded up your body so you wouldn't serve another god, and he delivered you. He sent his angel to deliver you. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there was no other god who was able to deliver in this way. What a big difference. At first it was there's no god who can deliver you from my hand, now there's no God who can deliver you like this. <laughs> Once again, he's given, and this man is given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to recognize the one true God. We're going to see that again in chapter 4. He's given one more chance. And I think at the end of chapter 4, he's finally convinced. But he here is not making a proclamation of monotheism. He's not saying there's only one God. What he is saying is this is that you can worship whatever God you want because we know there's more than one God, but you don't say anything about this God. Okay, so he's not a monotheist. He's not a believer yet. It doesn't seem to be so from his words. 
but um, he is saying he is the God of gods, and you don't say anything bad about these men or their God, uh, because this God has demonstrated that he is the Most High. He is the powerful God who delivers them even from the furnace and from my hand. And so the proclamation was once for the image, now it's you don't say anything negative about the God that these men serve. No. And then once again, they are honored and they are promoted. They are prospering in the province of Babylon. So, so what do we learn as we wrap it up here with our last minute? Um, first of all, obviously idolatry is forbidden. We see that from these men. Um, it could be committed in various ways. They were told, told to, to bow before an actual graven image. Uh, for us, idols can come in any form. It could be money, it could be careers, relationships, health, our possessions, hobbies, education. We can take anything in this world and elevate it to a position above God. And if we do that, we worship those things as idols. We may not bring food and burn incense to it or bow before it, but if anything in this world is more important than God, it becomes an idol. And we need to be aware of that. And uh, John Calvin is credited with saying this, that man's nature is a perpetual factory of idols. Mm -hmm. Meaning we're idol factories, we just make idols. The mind begets an idol and the hand gives it birth. So we can come up with all sorts of idols. I mean, we can turn anything into an idol. We can worship anything is his point. And we need to be careful with that. We also see here that God's people will be asked to compromise their faith and deny God. Okay? Now, that has happened throughout the ages. It could happen to us today in this country. These three men did not deny God. If you remember Peter, he did. He was challenged and he denied Christ three times. Of course, he repented, but he fell and it was a shameful fall and then he was restored by Christ himself. So they're going to come. If these men weren't exempt from it, if Peter the Apostle wasn't exempt from it, we're certainly not exempt from it. We might be asked to uh, take that stand uh, even though there are going to be extreme consequences. And uh, the pressures of the world are strong, but we have to be stronger in our commitment to God. And then we see here that true faith and courage accepts the will of God regardless of the favorability of the situation. Okay, Whatever is going on around us, we trust in God's will. We trust in God's providence and His sovereignty. Sometimes He brings deliverance, sometimes He allows us to pay the ultimate price. And in either situation, we have to be willing to stand firm and accept whatever God allows or ordains. Polycarp, who was the Bishop of Smyrna, was saying this when he was facing death by being burned. He said, four score and six years I have served him, meaning 86 years, and he has never done me injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? How then can I now blaspheme my king and savior? They wanted him to recant. They wanted him to deny his views. And he says, how can I do that? He's been faithful for 86 years. I'm not gonna deny him now. And then he dies. So we always have to trust in the power and the ability of God's will for our lives. Again, even if it's not the most favorable situation. So, let me go ahead and close in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. And we've got about 15 minutes before service begins. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to make it through another chapter of Daniel. And we pray, Lord, that we have learned something today. Thank you that you have demonstrated your power and you've demonstrated your provision for these men. And um, we just pray, Lord, that uh, we will be as resolved, Lord. We will have the same confidence and assurance and conviction that we are to serve you, Lord, whatever is uh, presented before us, whether it is blessing or curse or life or death, Lord, that we just stand firm in our um, faithfulness to you, knowing that you have always been faithful to us. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name.